All right. I get to uh, introduce one of my newest heroes now, uh, a young neurologist who's moved to the state of North Carolina, uh, working at Duke University and dealing with one of the hardest issues that we face is actually an issue that Dr. Class wrote about in the New York Times just a few days ago, uh, which is sleep. So, Dr. Sujay Kansagra is going to talk to us. He is the director of Duke University's Pediatric Neurology Sleep Medicine Program, the author of My Child Won't Sleep, a quick guide for the sleep-deprived parent, which I have been advising parents in my own practice to pick up uh, at, at online or in person. He's, he's the author of another book. He wrote a book about medical training as well. Uh, and he's going to come talk to us about the interaction between media use and sleep, which may be the, the Rosetta Stone key to a lot of the other things that we're concerned about when it comes to media. So, Dr. Consagra, come join us. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Everybody awake? Ready to hear about sleep? It's always nice to have a break before a sleep lecture. You can fill up on your caffeine, right? Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so make sure I get this clicker thing down. So no disclosures. I do have a personal disclosure, which is oftentimes I'm accused of being a sleep evangelist, not just a sleep doctor, a sleep evangelist. And I don't mind that label because I am extremely passionate about sleep. I'm hoping to share some of that passion with you guys today with the goal of really empowering you guys with a toolkit of sorts to go back and really help the children that you treat sleep better, okay? And if I play my cards right, maybe some of you will be making some choices to help yourselves sleep better, okay? So, the background, why is sleep so important? Okay, this is probably not a crowd that I really need to convince that sleep is important, but I'll say it anyway. I truly believe how we sleep dictates how we live. Okay? I'll say it again. How we sleep dictates how we live. And that's because sleep is vital for so much that's important to how we develop. Attention, memory. Dr. Pont talked about appetite regulation. Dr. Christakis talked about self-regulation. Our role as pediatricians is to, is to help these children develop into kind, productive, tax-paying citizens. And sleep is vital to that, it's vital to that, okay? So sleep is incredibly important. Now, what happens when you use electronics? What happens to our sleep? Well, there are lots of studies out there, and I wanna go through just a couple of those in the next two slides. There has been an association shown between increased social media use in young adults and increase, increase in sleep disruption. There has been an association between increased bedtime electronics in adolescents and decrease in sleep time. We've seen that if you sleep with a mobile device on, you have a decrease in sleep quality. Now, I, f I feel like adolescents these days live in this culture where you have to be connected 24-7, and it's true that they're getting texts and updates throughout the night. They feel obligated to check it because there's this culture that's been established where you have to be connected or you're not part of the in crowd. What else? TV viewing in children associated with decreased sleep time, increased evening screen use in infants, even down to infants, decreased sleep time. The number of devices in your bedroom as an adolescent correlates with the increase, decrease in sleep quality and violent content for young children, no matter the timing, daytime or nighttime, is associated with increase in sleep problems. So somebody might tell me, well, that's great, Dr. Consagra, but you've just shown an association with your epidemiologic studies. Perhaps these people actually have sleep problems at baseline and they're just filling in their extra time at night with media use. And I'll say, sure, that's fair. The arrow likely points in both directions, but there actually, we do have prospective studies, and Dr. Christakis has offered one of these studies that shows that if you actually give parents a media use plan and they incorporate it, sleep problems improve. So certainly, in my opinion, the arrow is larger when it points to using media, disrupting sleep. All right. Why does media, electronic media disrupt sleep? There are two main reasons. The first reason is fairly obvious, which is stimulation, right? Stimulation from media. These days, media come at you in a very high-paced, dynamic, multi-dimensional way. We're not passive consumers of media anymore. We generate content, and that actually changes our neurochemistry. I'm a pediatric neurologist, so I think of everything in the term of neurotransmitters. The main neurotransmitters that are keeping us awake in our ascending reticular activating system, the main ones are acetylcholine, histamine, dopamine, norepinephrine. 
And when you look at these children that are consuming all these YouTube videos at a fast pace, violent content, your sympathetic nervous system is really raging. And so for me, YouTube is really, it's the norepinephrine tube is what it really is. Because really, this is what you're giving folks. You're giving the norepinephrine. Of course they're going to be awake. And then when it comes to the Facebook like button, right? When somebody goes onto your Facebook profile, hits that like button, and you see that they like your vacation photos, they're actually handing you a little packet of dopamine is what they're doing, right? Like, here's a little packet of dopamine for you. And dopamine keeps you awake, so it's not the like button. If you ask me what it is, it's the dopamine button, okay? I've emailed Mark Zuckerberg to make this change. No word yet. I'll keep you posted. All right, so our neurochemistry changes. We know that. So that's one part of how electronic media disrupts our sleep. The rest of this lecture I actually want to focus on what I think is the, the major component in how this affects our sleep. And to introduce that, I take you back to the 1700s. This is the mimosa plant. The mimosa plant is a heliotrope, so it actually changes its leaf pattern to face the sun. And a scientist in the 1700s in France saw this pattern, and he said, certainly this plant must be picking up on some sort of signal from the sun, and the plant will open its leaves during the daytime. It'll open its leaves. And so what he did was he took the mimosa plant and he put it into a dark room. And he was surprised to find that even though the plant had no exposure to sunlight whatsoever, the plant still opened and closed its leaves in a roughly 24-hour cycle. When it was daytime outside, the leaves opened up. And when it was night, they closed back up. And at the time, he conjectured that perhaps the plant has some magical way of detecting when the sun is out that we really can't sense. What he didn't realize, and it wasn't discovered until decades later, he had stumbled upon the circadian rhythm, the internal body clock, which all living things on this planet possess. It's all part and parcel of evolving on a planet with a 24-hour daylight cycle. Human beings have it. All animals have it. Plants have it. Fungi has a circadian rhythm. Even down to unicellular organisms, they have some semblance of a circadian rhythm. And when I talk about circadian rhythm, oftentimes we think of it as just sleep-wake. That is just one of the things that's a, that the circadian rhythm does. It actually modulates a whole host of physiologic and metabolic processes in all of us. And even on the macroscopic level, we talk about sleep-wake for the circadian rhythm. But even at the organ system level, we all have circadian rhythms. So for example, the liver will metabolize medications differently based on the time of the day that you administer a medication. We think our lungs have their own internal circadian rhythm, and that's probably partly to explain why asthma symptoms actually get worse at nighttime. The endocrine system has its own circadian rhythm and secretes a whole host of hormones in a circadian fashion, depending on the time of the day. So it works at the organ system level, not just the macroscopic organ, um, entire organism level. It also works down to the cellular level. I could take one of your white blood cells out of your body, analyze the proteins that are being expressed, and tell you exactly where you are in your circadian day. Because even each of your individual cells harbors its own circadian rhythm. And that's because a whole host of the genome, 20, 30% of your genome, is actually to proteins are translated in a circadian fashion. More proteins at a certain time of the day, last another time of the day. So it really, it goes down to the cellular level, which is an important part of what we're gonna talk about. Now, the circadian rhythm I've depicted in the yellow bars here. Now, if there's one slide I'd ask you to kind of lock into your visual memory stores, this is a slide, because it nicely explains sleep physiology. We're gonna talk about the circadian rhythm, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the homeostatic sleep drive, which is in the blue arrows. Now, on the x-axis here, you have an entire 24-hour day, 9 a.m. one morning to 9 a.m. the next morning. What happens during that time? The blue arrows tell you about the homeostatic sleep drive. And what that means is that while we're awake, our brains are going through lots and lots of metabolic processes, and we're breaking down ATP, and we're making adenosine as a byproduct. What your brain does is it actually has receptors for adenosine. So the longer you've been awake, the more adenosine builds up, and the sleepier your brain gets. So it's a pretty easy concept to understand. The longer you're awake, the sleepier you feel, based on adenosine. When you fall asleep, your brain actually churns through that adenosine so that the next morning, if you've got an adequate amount of sleep, you're ready to go again with no mental fog, you're refreshed completely. Now, there's a very interesting substance that many of you probably have floating around in your system right now that actually blocks adenosine receptors in your brain and tricks your brain into thinking you have not been awake as long as you've been awake. Some of you are ingesting it right now as we speak. It's caffeine, caffeine. Okay? This is the other arch nemesis of a sleep physician, caffeine. I could talk all day about caffeine. Maybe if you invite me back, we can have a conversation about caffeine and sleep. 
But caffeine ends up hurting the homeostatic sleep drive, okay? That's one of the major processes. Now, we know that this is not how we feel during the day, right? You don't just get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier and then pass out at night. That's just not how it works. And that's because of the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm gives you an alerting signal throughout the day in a very predictable, repetitive, roughly 24-hour fashion. And it makes you feel alert at certain times. It makes you feel sleepy at certain times. And so if you look at the yellow arrows, and we start at the, the left side here at 9 a.m., on an average circadian timing, this is kind of a depiction of average, your circadian rhythm starts to actually make you feel alert early in the morning, and it keeps revving up for a few hours in the morning. It then takes the all too familiar dip between one and three, okay? Everybody blames lunch, right? Ah, I had a big lunch, I'm sleepy. Lunch gets a bad rap, it's not lunch. It's the circadian rhythm, okay? Blame your circadian rhythm. Even if you didn't eat lunch, you're gonna feel sleepy. And if you had a big breakfast or a big dinner, you don't feel sleepy right afterwards. It's not the meal, it's your circadian rhythm. Then, after this dip, the circadian alerting signal actually revs up, and it revs up quite nicely. It becomes very, very much peaked right before it's time for you to go to bed. And this is an important thing to, to realize. Your circadian alerting signal is at its peak right before it's time for you to go to sleep. And that's why it's very difficult to move your sleep time earlier. Okay? It's much easier to move your sleep time later. It's very hard to move sleep time earlier. And then, mercifully, as the night hits, the circadian alerting signal on its own just kind of gives way and allows you to fall asleep, and allows you to stay asleep throughout the night by remaining very, very low. And the process starts back up the very next day. Now, everybody's yellow bars, okay, your circadian up and down mimics what I'm showing you here. But the timing of those bars, you can shift them completely to the left or the right. And the main thing that sets where your bars are is your exposure to light, okay? We talk about Zeitgebers in sleep medicine. Zeitgebers is a German term for time givers. Your, your light exposure is the main time giver for your circadian rhythm. There are only a, whole, a few things that can actually change where you guys are on your circadian timing. Light is one of them, melatonin is one of them, social interactions is actually one of them, the timing of food take is another. So food intake will actually change where your arrow is light. But the main one is actually light exposure. If you get light exposure late at night, so in this example here, we're talking eight, nine, 10 o'clock, all of these arrows, you're exposing your brain to light during your brain's nighttime. All of the arrows shift in the, right, in the rightward direction. So it peaks later, so you want to go to bed later, and you also want to wake up later. That's a very important concept that I tell my families. I say, your brain has no way of distinguishing artificial light from sunlight. And so the whole topic of this lecture is the medium is the message. And that's extremely true for your brain. The medium is the message. The light from the medium is telling your brain where it should be setting its day-night cycle and setting the circadian rhythm. And so light is a very important part of where these arrows are set. Now, all of us have a morning versus evening preference. It's, cons it's called our chronotype. And that's based on where these arrows fall for you. Light dictates where it stands. Your genetic preference actually dictates where it stands. So for those of you that are night owls, all of these arrows are shifted slightly to the right. So you tend to want to stay up late, and you have a hard time getting up in the morning, as opposed to the morning larks out there, the morning-ish chronotype, in which you actually fall asleep and feel sleepy early in the night, and when you wake up, you're full of energy, ready to go, you're the envy of all of your medical colleagues. That's the morning-ish chronotype. A part of that is genetically regulated. You oftentimes mimic a parental chronotype. And so if you're a night owl, chances are one of your parents are night owls as well. But the other thing that affects your circadian rhythm, the timing, is your age. We know that older school children and adolescents naturally develop a preference for a delayed chronotype. This is why the AAP has put out recommendations on delayed school start times for high schools and, and middle schools. It's because this is a natural process that occurs when a child is in the adolescent time period. The opposite is true when we get older, much, much older. We actually have a preference for a morning chronotype. Everything moves earlier. That's why in the retirement home, supper is served at four o'clock, okay? <laughs> Things move earlier. You wanna to go to bed earlier, you wanna wake up earlier. It's something that happens. Now, when you combine an adolescent's preference for a delayed chronotype with exposure to light at nighttime, you're setting yourself up for disaster, for disaster when it comes to sleep, okay? Now, Again, this is an example of those yellow bars I showed you, the up and down, the natural up and down in your circadian rhythm. The higher the peak, the more awake you feel throughout the day. This is another example of a 24-hour time course. So if you consider this as a normal chronotype, where you start around 8 or 9 o'clock, you have a dip around 1, or 1 to 3 o'clock, 
you peak around 8 to 9 o'clock, and then you fall off and go to sleep around 10. If this is normal, what happens to our adolescents, particularly when they're exposed to light late at night, is this. It's the same chart. Everything is shifted over to the right. Make sense? Everything is shifted over. So now their dip will occur maybe around 3, 4, or 5 o'clock when they get home. And they will be wide awake until 11, 12, 1 o'clock. And they will struggle to wake up in the morning because that alerting signal just hasn't started quite yet. This ends up affecting when we sleep, obviously. When the circadian alerting signal is there and not dictates when we sleep. So if you consider a normal sleep chunk, this blue, this blue block is a normal sleep chunk. If midnight to 8 o'clock is a normal sleep chunk, folks that have an advanced preference will maybe sleep from 8 to 4. Folks that have delayed sleep phase will be up very late, may end up sleeping 2, 3, 4 o'clock at night, and want to wake up at noon the next day. So a circadian rhythm disorder occurs when this really impacts the way that a child or an adult ends up functioning, meeting societal obligations. Now, circadian rhythm disorders, they're defined by actually normal sleep quality and quantity if you let them sleep whenever the heck they want to sleep, okay? So if it's a weekend, a vacation time, you let them sleep, they'll sleep a normal amount, and the quality of sleep will be completely normal. They're just sleeping at the wrong time. They're sleeping at the wrong time compared to the social clock. They have their own clock going on. They're sleeping at the wrong time. And they have entrained the various zeitgebers or time givers. And when it comes to electronic media, of course, the light and also the social interaction from those devices will alter your circadian rhythm. Now, it's a very important concept. We talked about how you're different down to the cellular level. When adolescents are shifted, when young, young children are shifted, they have been shifted down to their cellular level. They are different at the cellular level, okay? Really, a lot has changed in their bodies. Now, I put this in the handout section. This is just the criteria based on the international classification of sleep disorders and how to define somebody that has a circadian rhythm disorder, a delayed sleep-wake syndrome, or as we know it in the past, delayed sleep phase syndrome. And basically, the criteria are that they have a significant delay in their major sleep episode in relation to the desired or required sleep and wake time. The symptoms have been present for at least three months. If they're allowed to choose their schedule, they exhibit improved sleep quality and duration and maintain this delayed preference. And ideally, you'd want to confirm this using sleep logs or an actigraph thing that they wear, like, like a Fitbit that tells you when they've been awake and when they've been asleep. Now, what can you do? This is where I'm hopefully will empower you guys with a toolkit that you can take back to your practices to really benefit and help, help these kids. I think almost every sleep problem can be fixed with a step-by-step -step approach, okay? This is my step-by-step -step approach for delayed sleep phase and circadian rhythm issues. Step one is part of good sleep hygiene, right? Which is avoid late night light. <coughs> Easier said than done, of course, right? Children have lots of things they need to do that, that involves light, schoolwork, et cetera. It's hard to get them away from it. If they can't avoid light completely, and again, the recommendation is avoiding it for an hour before bedtime, bright lights from electronic media, then I tell them the brightness is also important. We know that the brighter the light, which is measured in lux, the more likely you are to suppress your own brain's melatonin. And there have been lots of great studies done. And just to put it in perspective, when it comes to lux, this room is probably about 100 lux. If you're outdoors right now, direct sunlight, it's really around 50,000 lux. And if you're in a room that's really, really dim, we're talking like 10 lux. But an average, average lit room is about probably like 150 to 200 lux. Studies have shown that in luminescence down to 50 lux can actually shift your circadian timing and inhibit your melatonin secretion to a certain extent. So brightness is important. So I say, listen, if you can't get rid of the tablet, please just turn the brightness down completely. So brightness is important. The timing of light exposure, which we'll talk a bit about in a second, is important. And then the color. You guys have heard this, right? The color of the light that you get is important in your circadian rhythm. It's because we found that 480 nanometer wavelength of light is what's most, most likely to cause you to have suppression of melatonin in a delayed sleep phase. And that corresponds to blue light. So there are plenty of apps out there that'll help eliminate blue light from your, or they claim to eliminate blue light from your devices. And so if you can't do anything else, consider using that. But again, you know, this isn't the end-all and be-all. Just because you eliminate blue light doesn't mean you're not going to be affected by the remaining light spectra. Okay? Green light will delay you. Red light is the least likely to delay you. But all of these various wavelengths of visible light can delay your sleep phase. Step two, maintain a set bedtime and wake time each day, including on the weekends. This is where I lose a lot of my adolescence, right? They're like, you've got to be kidding me. But let me give you an example of what happens to our adolescents. So let's say they need about nine hours of sleep. On a weeknight, you're aiming to get them to bed around nine o'clock. You're aiming to wake them up around six o'clock to start school. Friday night hits, they're like, you know what? I'm gonna stay awake till mm, 11, and I'm gonna wake up at eight the next morning so to get my nine hours. 
On Saturday night, you're like, ah, I'm gonna stay awake till two, then I'm gonna sleep till 11, right? This is like your typical teenager. This has become typical for us. This is a typical teenager. So now their bedtime is two o'clock, wake time is 11 o'clock, and then Sunday night, it's, and what am I asking them to do? I'm asking them to go to bed again at nine o'clock at night. I'm asking them to shift their circadian rhythm, which is delayed over the weekend till two o'clock. I'm asking them to shift it earlier by nine, to nine o'clock, by five hours. That is the equivalent of flying from Hawaii to New York, right, on Sunday night. That's what you're asking them to do. You're asking them to shift their internal body clock by five hours. You can't do that on one night. And so these poor adolescents, these poor children, spend the rest of the school week slowly advancing their sleep time, only to do it all again on the weekend. They are perpetually jet lagged. No wonder they're so angry all the time, right? They're perpetually jet lagged. This is derm social jet lag. They're jet lagging themselves without even having to travel. Social jet lag, so keep that concept in mind. And this really helps families get a sense of what they're dealing with, because families are like, ah, they're just lazy, they don't want to get out of bed. Sleepiness has become synonymous with laziness. Sleepiness is not laziness. Sleepiness is a problem with the quality or quantity of your sleep. It's not laziness, okay? And I have to impart this on families, too. You really have to get parents to buy in on this, because this is, this is really a, a contentious area for a lot of families, okay? Now, you want to expose them to light early in the morning. Just like late light in your brain's nighttime will delay everything, a light early in the morning actually advances everything. And it gets you in the right spot. It gets you to move everything earlier, such that you want to go to bed earlier and you want to wake up earlier. The key to this is that you want to expose them to light after their temperature nadir. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Why is that exactly? So I told you about the concept of shifting. You shift these yellow bars, depending on your light exposure. So at 9 o'clock, if you get lots of light from your tablet, from your television, everything shifts to the right. If you wake up in this example at 8 o'clock and you get light, it actually shifts you in the right direction. You go in, in the leftward direction, okay, in the correct direction. It shifts you earlier. Now, let's say I woke somebody up at 1 o'clock in the morning, put lots of bright lights in their face. What would that do to their circadian physiology? Well, 1 o'clock in the morning in this particular example is still the brain's night, and so everything shifts towards the right. If I woke them up at, say, 7 o'clock in the morning and I gave them light, what would it do? it would shift everything to the left. It's considered the brain's morning. So if you think about this concept, there must be some time while we're asleep where exposure to light flips. It goes from something that delays our circadian rhythm to advances our circadian rhythm. And we found that point. It actually occurs about three hours prior to the time that you would naturally wake up. It's called the point of singularity. If you get light exposure just five minutes before this time, it delays your circadian rhythm. If you get light just five minutes after this time, it actually advances your circadian rhythm. It's a fascinating thing that our circadian rhythm does for us that many of us don't even realize. So if you have a child, I usually ask them about weekend sleep preference. When do you prefer to sleep naturally on the weekends? And if they're like, ah, I prefer to go to bed at one o'clock, wake up at 10 o'clock, well then I count backwards by three hours. And I say, well then, your point where your temperatures are lowest is seven in the morning. My goal is to expose you to bright light after seven o'clock. So if they have to wake up at six o'clock for school, I don't tell them to turn on the bright lights right when they wake up because I'm actually hurting myself. I'm doing the opposite. I'm delaying them even more if I give them light at six o'clock in the morning, okay? I say, you wait, keep things dim until seven o'clock and then open up the curtains and get all the bright light that you can to help advance your circadian rhythm. So timing, timing is incredibly important. <laughs> Step four, melatonin. Ah, melatonin and sleep. I could talk to you all day about melatonin and sleep. Everybody, melatonin seems to be kind of the, the go-to drug. But circadian change is actually where you should be using melatonin. Melatonin plays no role in insomnia for otherwise neurocognitively normal children. Melatonin plays no role for these, these children. For insomnia, it plays no role. And that's because melatonin is not really a hypnic agent. It doesn't make you feel sleepy. I could drink a whole bottle of melatonin in front of you. I'm not going to conk out. It doesn't make you sleepy. It simply tells your brain, hey, it's dark outside. You should do what your brain is supposed to do when it's dark. That's what melatonin does. And so nocturnal animals secrete melatonin at night, even though they're awake all night, okay? So it's just a signal to your brain that says it's dark. Do what you're supposed to do when it's dark. The melatonin is good for shifting your circadian rhythm. And we're talking low doses, half a milligram to a milligram. And the timing of it is very important. Two to six hours prior to their current sleep time. That's what you need to truly shift the circadian rhythm, okay? Now, I advise my, my patients to use um, only synthetic melatonin, okay? All natural melatonin comes from the pineal glands of cows. Cows, brain, cow brains, cow brains, all right? So there's theoretical risk of transmitting bad stuff when we start messing with cow brains. So use the, all, use the synthetic version. 
Thankfully, even most companies that claim they're all natural, most of the melatonin synthesis right now is based in the lab. It's not animal products. But you want to be careful. It should say vegetarian or synthetic on the bottle. I usually trust some of the big brand pharmacy chains and using their generic version of melatonin. It seems to be pretty effective. So this is where you should think about melatonin, OK? And then step five, convince the child this is important. This is so tough. This is difficult. You have to have the adolescent buy-in. You have to have the older child to buy into all the things that you're doing, because this is, this is difficult. And we talked about how adolescence, this is a time of increasing independence. And even young you know, school-age children, sleep can be a time where there's a battle. And it really frustrates parents, because you can take a child's car keys away. You can take away all their money. You can take away all their devices. You cannot go in their brains and make them sleep. Right? This is under the child's control. This is something they control. So if you can't convince the child that they need to make this change and have the parents buy in in a productive way, in a cooperative way, you're going to be in trouble. And so this is where motivational interviewing is important. On a scale of 0 to 10, Johnny, what is your chance of actually implementing the change I just talked about? Hmm, about a 2, Dr. Kinsan. OK. Why wasn't it a 1? Hmm, well, you know, I, I think I could probably do better in school. You think you can do better in school? I think that's fantastic. That is fantastic. You have found a great reason why you want to make a change. I like that. Let's work with that, OK? I have no problems with sometimes even if, if it's a child that's like zero, you know, there's no, there's no chance I'm going to do this. Uh, sometimes I'll even appeal to vanity. There are studies that show that you actually look better, your wrinkles are less prominent. When you sleep better, the dark circles in your eyes improve. And so sometimes I have to resort to that too. But you really want to find their motivation to make the change. Now, if all of that fails, the Hail Mary of circadian rhythm treatment is called chronotherapy. And I usually reserve this for the child that has such far delayed sleep phase. This is the child that's not sleepy till 4 in the morning. They asked you to sign the homebound paperwork because the school doesn't want them there anymore because all they do is sleep through the first four periods of, of school. Chronotherapy is essentially ignoring everything I just told you about. So I'll tell the family, I'll say, you know what I want you to do tonight? I want you to go home. You usually go to bed at 4 o'clock. I want you to stay up, and I want you to play video games. I want you to tweet your heart out. I want you to be up till 6 o'clock tonight. Can you do that? They're like, yeah, no problem. I can stay up till 6 o'clock. So you get tons and tons of light until 6 o'clock, and then you let them go to sleep, and you let them sleep in. And then I say, the next night, I want you to actually stay up till 8 in the morning. Do the same thing. Tons of light, OK? Sleep in as long as you can. Of course, you have to have some flexibility in the schedule, right? You have to be on vacation or actually on homebound. And then every day, subsequent, I say, go to bed two hours later. So you're at 10 AM, then noon, then 2 PM, then 4 PM, then 6 PM, then 8 PM, and then magically they're back at their sleep time, 10 PM, <laughs> right? You have actually delayed them around the entire clock. Teenagers have no problem doing this. You can do this. They can do this. They have no problems with this. But they have to be motivated to make the change. And they love this prescription. I tell them to get lots of light. But once they get to that 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever your goal bedtime is, that's when you institute 1 through 4 again. Avoid the bright light. Give them the melatonin, all the things that we talked about. OK? So you can, you can do that. You can work them completely around the clock. So that's it. So changes in practice. What things can you take back with you? Use melatonin as a clock shifting agent not as a sleep induction agent. Use low dose, use a synthetic formulation two to six hours prior to bed. Dose your light at the right times. Morning light, but remember the timing. Remember about the point of singularity that we talked about. Consider dimming and eliminating blue light if they can't eliminate late night light. And then explain to families that these devices are creating a form of social jet lag, that these children are different down to the cellular level. They have to cooperate with this. Of course, the, your children have to cooperate, but your parents have to cooperate with this, OK? And then find the patient's motivation to change. All right, so that's it for me. If you, uh, hopefully, we'll have time for uh, questions after all the sessions are done. If we don't get to your question, please find me. I love talking about sleep. So sleep problems for your patients, your own children, your own sleep issues, come find me during the conference. I'm happy to talk to you about it, OK? Thank you for your attention. I don't know about you, my mind is blown right now. That was, it's amazing. We're going to go do some stuff different when we get home.